And I sing, and they say, hey, man, you, you, got, you got soul in that music. And I said, yeah, I, I play a little bit, you know. I like music. And they said, man, you're really somebody. I said, oh, I am? Oh, I just got out of jail. I don't know what somebody is. They like my music. They say, man, we want to get you over. I said, get me over for what? They said, we take you down here to Beverly Hills, and we want to get you in with because you're a star. I said, I'm a what? They said, you're a star. So they took me to the Beach Boys. Brain, I did not break the law. Jesus Christ told you that 2,000 years ago. You don't understand me. That's your trouble. Not my fault because you don't understand me. I don't understand you either. But I don't spend my whole life trying to put the blame over on you because my cigarette didn't light or because something didn't work right. What do you want to call me a murderer for? I've never killed anyone. I don't need to kill anyone. I think it. I have it here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Nick's Nonfiction. You are here with your host, Nick Munez. On the show today, we have chaos. Charles Manson, the CIA, and the secret history of the 1960s. Written by Tom O'Neill. This guy is making the rounds on the media right now. He dedicated 20 years to this book. What is it about? On the night of August 8th, 1969, Sharon Tate and friends, girlfriend of Roman Polanski, were barbarically murdered in the hills of Hollywood, which would result in the longest and most expensive trial, most public trial in United States history until the OJ trial. This was a freak show that was blasting through the tube on every new color television in America. This was the time where Walter Cronkite would come on and put the Vietnam death numbers on your TV. It was the biggest military the world has ever seen. And the secret history of the 60s, that free love counterculture had to be subverted. It was the decade with the most civil unrest, maybe until the 2020s we will see. But the 1960s had the Black Panthers, had the love movement, and we are getting into all the agent smiths there was a roger smith there was a jolly west a dr reeve whitson all these cover names pseudonyms for books that were being published these guys were infiltrating the panthers running their own tests at the hate ashbury free medical clinic these ties go deep just when you think like a good documentary it can't go any deeper Tom O'Neill takes out his pickaxe and he finds another layer. He went over Vincent Bugliosi, Bugliosi, we're going to be calling him Bugs today. His original account of the Manson murders, Helter Skelter, you might have heard of. That book is baloney. He is going to discredit in 12 quick chapters today. Much like if you've heard of David Talbot, one of the best investigative reporters of our time, he wrote Devil's Chessboard. That was about moving all kinds of sleeper cells and agents from the SS to America. Tom O'Neill's up there with John Perkins, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. This is years of his life dedicated to a cause that nobody seems to care about anymore, but at one time was the biggest deal in America. So let's get into the about the author. It's going to be a quicker one. As for a longer book, there's not too much about Tom O'Neill online anyway. There shouldn't be. He's in the business of the press or the real press. They should be digging up the dirt. And you don't want to have your house and your wife and your kids where they go to school up there. You're going to get a text from FBI man. Hey, I was looking at your browser history. And here's a picture of your kid going into the school. We can nab them any day. How about you halt that investigation, Mr. O'Neill? Tom said he ignored all of that, but one of the things he learned throughout his investigative process was when you're getting threats, you're getting warmer. You are getting closer to the truth. It's also, you know, a 400-page book, so this guy is doing all kinds of rounds on, like, the podcast circuit on some sorts of radio. So go catch him. He's expelling the whole story, but you got the whole story within two hours today. Tom O'Neill did try to get this saga sold to Netflix, but they tried to get their hands all up in his 20 years of work, and he said we had to separate ties for creative differences. He is in the works with Amazon, what are they called, Amazon Studios purchased the rights to the film, and he wants to do it like a docu-series, because you'll see today how many layers go into this thing. Let's just hope 
Bezos doesn't scam us on us with another fluff piece. You know, you guys saw this uh, Epstein documentary came out this summer. It was like a total distraction, if you will. It was um, even at the end, they show one of the paintings of the victims who went to his fuck island. And Epstein's up in the corner. His like accomplice, Ghislaine, is front and center. We're going to hope that maybe Amazon's letting out a little more factuality in their documentaries tom o'neill has a backbone you're gonna learn how deep he went today and how strong you gotta be to put up with that for years at the beginning of the book he has pictures of it he was like a spry young man and it's like he went through 10 presidencies he became a gray geezer by the end of it he was on the joe rogan experience earlier in 2020 we all know that guy's going over to spotify with a hundred million dollars When you can't get a publishing deal, it goes to show now you can get on one of the biggest shows where you have an audience of 15 million and then sell that to other publishers. So you're not getting screwed over like we learned last week on On Writing with Stephen King. You have the agency now as the writer. Other works by Tom O'Neill, he's not a one-trick pony. He wrote Shark Tank in 2005. That was a book about FBI agents embedding themselves with New York drug operations. So Tom's always trying to get into these countercultures, trying to infiltrate some sort of movement. He also went with the Battle of Colmut. Colmut? I'm not doing the Irish people justice here. It was a book about the IRA's biggest defeat fighting for uh, freedom from the crown that shit is still going on in the 21st century he says uh like you're not going to read the battle of column if you're not super interested in irish politics and tom knows i only was able to do that because i was super interested in the topic so this deep dive on charlie manson would have never happened if he wasn't enthralled with it and you'll hear in two minutes this guy knew nothing about the story when he got the call Another book, Why the Center Can't Hold, he wrote this one in 2016, and he basically called the whole freedom versus lockdown thing, where we have Schrodinger's virus, we both do have and do not have the virus at the same time, you are asymptomatic, but you can spread it, not, says the World Health Organization, the virus knows if you're at a white privilege rally versus a Black Lives Matter, who, where do those donations go? Many questions that are going to be answered, or not. Maybe declassified in 60 years, as Tom O'Neill is a hound on that Freedom of Information Act. And the reason I got these books, it was pretty sketchy. When I was moving out of Denver, I lived on Clayton Street for two years, and I never saw this guy. And one day, there's a box of books in front of his house, and it had a book called Blackwater, um, Veil, about the secret CIA wars of the 1980s in the Middle East. We got... This one, Chaos, the Secret Societies of the 60s. And then you got, and then he had a book about Enron. I'm, this was a mystery man. Does he wear a trench coat everywhere? I'm sure when he finally left his house this one day in two years, he just rolled to the curb in his rolly chair. Mummy, make more tendies. I'm on my way back in. And that's basically where the book comes from. That's Tom O'Neill. Let's get into the story for the day. Chapter 1, The Crime of the Century. You're getting all the backstory of this court case. In March of 1999, Tom O'Neill, freelance journalist that he was, hadn't worked in months, and he moved out to sunny California just to get out of it. He was on Venice Beach at the moment, and he had some of those success stories we learned back in New York City. A forum editor for US Us Magazine was on the phone, and they offered him a 30th anniversary Manson piece. Having done some of these investigative stories before and living in Cali, he had interviewed people like Alec Baldwin, who he pissed off and was asked to leave his estate. Tom Cruise, he argued with about uh, Scientology. Gary Shandling had ditched him at a dinner, but he's excited to have a new domain. He thinks those stars are a letdown, but he'll have the connections to the Tates and all those Hill people that come into the story. It was a 5,000-word piece they were asking for within three months that's about a hundred pages so that's a pretty deep rabbit hole that you're gonna have to go down there tom who was never theoristically inclined he thought everybody who didn't believe the warren commission the jfk assassination were crazies you got to go along with the news the first thing tom did was read helter skelter which is the prosecuting attorney of manson for this case vincent bugliosi his account of the murders and how it got to this point. 
And even a bigger point, I should have brought this up earlier, the movie Quentin Tarantino, he's only doing 10 movies, the ninth one just came out. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood it was about the Spawn Ranch, which was apparently where Manson and some of these people bought their prostitutes were running the operations out of. At the end of that movie, I could spoil it now, it's over a year old, they are next to Sharon Tate's house, Margot Robbie in the movie, and Leo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt beat the shit out of Sharon Atkins and the murderers. It's like a Tarantino, he made Inglorious Bastards, he puts a spin on history. And that one was pretty cool. Tom said that he was interviewed by Tarantino. He knew this guy was on the case. And so very cool behind the scenes going on as long as his investigation was. Got to meet some really cool people. When Tom first came across the murder scene, there are some leaked pictures. It looked like a picture-perfect puzzle. And if you talk to a crime investigator, a detective, or even a detective journalist, he is a detective, you'll see. He's going, this is a picture-perfect crime. Everything seems to be in place. And upon reading Bugliosi's Helter Skelter... What do uh, detectives look for? A motive. There has to be a motive to a murder. That's the best way to triangulate the truth. There was no motive for Charles Manson to tell some group of four kids to go kill some stars. It gets into it deeper. So on August 8th of 1969, on the front page of the LA Times, there was not blood on the walls, oh my god, hate, scare, race riot. It was a normal day. Walter Cronkite was talking about how the franc was being devalued, and then he put the ticker of all the Americans that died in some southeast country. Less than three weeks earlier, America had put man on the moon. The space race was in full swing. Very eventful time. It was the year after the summer of love, up in the hate. This was the night on the 9th, Sadie Atkins. They peeled out of the Spawn movie ranch, which is about 500 mountainous acres. That movie portrays it very nice. And she was with a couple other young, struggling actors, a Texas guy, and then a couple other girls who were just known to be in Manson's circle. So the four showed up to 150 Cielo Drive. You know I'm out here on the West Coast now. I drove by Cielo Drive. It's been blocked off for 70 years now almost how nuts is that (laughs) you can't even go within whatever of the murder house people are moving in and off this block cielo drive as the story develops but this was sharon tate's house it was maybe paid for by roman polanski her boyfriend who was in london on this very night and uh, he got the call there's jello caked on the walls of your wife's blood or (laughs) it was a very hollywood scene in real life as Atkins and the group of hippies, so they say, rolled up to the house. They shot the guard out front four times. Nobody on Cielo Drive heard. They break into the dining room window. There's a 39-year-old Polish filmmaker just sprawled out on the couch. The kid, (laughs) I think it was the Texas kid at first, kicked him in the head and said, I am the devil. Just a guy that kicked in the head remembers this. Sharon Tate she was Miss Texas. She's an absolute smoke show. They chose Margot Robbie for a reason. At six years old was when she won that little pageant. She would stop traffic when she moved to New York. She was pregnant at the time. This makes the murder even more egregious. And apparently the kids tied up the Polish director and Tate. And they stabbed them six times, both of the friends. And Tate, pregnant woman, not the two 39-year-old men, where she was able to break the ties and she ran out onto her front lawn. And as the story goes, in Helter Skelter, Sharon Tate was turned over and her womb was stabbed 28 times. While one of the other guys, Frykowski, was getting beat to death. Truly barbaric murder. The media was calling it a blood orgy. They didn't have any motive for about three months. They didn't know who the killer was. And that's when the La Bianca, another actress, was murdered two weeks later. And the police at first deemed these murders mutually exclusive. That is the official report. Those four months passed, and in those four months was the Beatles' White Album came out. And remember, that was part of the media. Charles Manson thinks that the White Album is talking to him specifically. And on December 1st, Ed Davis, the LAPD chief at the time, he was in one of the biggest conferences ever called for a court case. He didn't give out any names, but they said 
the Barker Movie Ranch is home to our killers. We'll learn later that the spawn ranch where Charlie was was being bugged the entire time. So was this misdirection from the police force? Official story says the killers were at the Barker Ranch, which is like 500 miles south of L.A. And at this time in America, the counterculture we're talking about of the 60s, kids hitchhiked everywhere. So now that there's a murderers being trafficked around and brainwashed by vagabond followers of this culture it's uh gonna twist a knife in those <laughs> people who are sending their kids to college and turn into hippies maybe not has changed much in america just the hippies now create an antifa state in seattle that runs out of bread within two days so manson was proclaimed after those four months and they found their killers down on barker ranch as the character who set the murders out he's in like fifth degree murder where you are able to call a hit on someone else he's being held liable manson they start putting his story out into the news he broke out of juvenile detention when he was 16 he was sent to a washington dc boys camp in 1952 he was 17 he had a wife and a kid he was 17 he moved out to san pedro california he started pimping women stole cars disappeared to mexico for a little bit and his history starts getting real sketchy but since he was 17 the fbi was surveilling charles manson and this was obviously a violation of they didn't have the patriot act back then they had what was called the man act which said without a warrant you're not allowed to follow people around and record them imagine how it is now they um, went whole hog on him illegally from the beginning. More about his history a little bit just to draw the picture. Manson dabbled in Scientology in those years, just in and out of the prison system. He picked up the guitar, he got decently good, and he just got followers, grew out his hair, played into that counterculture, and got his own followers, man. He was a micro-influencer before <laughs> social media popped up. All you need is a love bus back then. And they said they started portraying the uh, Manson family over those four months of investigation in the media as a cult of free sex, motorcycle-riding, drug-doing, bloodthirsty robots, a nomadic band of hippies, a pseudo-religious cult <laughs> where men and women get along, no money. That, again, the biggest war culture ever had to be subverted. We are on an entirely different path of history. The Tate murder trial started in July of 1970, almost a year and a half after. Bugliosi's trying to pin the entire thing on Manson. His followers are no longer bloodthirsty robots. They are the prophets of Armageddon. You'll learn later, Jolly West is one of the guys who is testing students at the hate and where Charles had a house. And his objective was to try to wipe people's minds, give them psychosis with them being unaware of it. And so if you slip someone 500 mics of acid and don't tell them they're tripping, they're going to think they're going crazy. And so Jolly, totally unethically, this is, we're going to get into MK Ultra. He just fried people's minds, so it is very suspected. You've seen the court cases where Manson is... <laughs> it's like the third week of the trials, and he's going... <laughs> and he's just fucking making faces, and he has an X carved into his forehead. It's suspected that he was fried during the uh, investigation process. They swapped out Atkins' lawyer. Whole lot of scary shit. But it turned into a freak show. Seven months of trial. This was court coverage out the ass. America had never seen this before. And when you have that many people tuned in, it's one of the biggest stages ever. You're able to push a narrative, which is kind of what it seems like they're doing with Helter Skelter and Bugliosi's report. The reason for the MK Ultra, if you read the declassified accounts, which is accessible to everybody in this country, we were scared so many United States soldiers were defecting and moving to Russia, the Soviet Union, because they thought the guise of communism looks a lot better from afar and we were thinking how are they so effective are they drugging our troops we need some of that manson mojo so they had the agent smith's roger smith on this case <laughs> pushing a narrative you got people coming to the courtroom with x's carved into their forehead i am xing myself out of society this thing was the revival of the barnum barely circus chapter two we are in an aura of danger. O'Neill 
is starting his investigation. He feels like he has absolutely nothing to write this piece about. Like, obviously, the murders affected people. What else? It's a Jesus-looking guy with telekinetic mind-wipe murder abilities. What's new? So he starts going into the hills of East Hollywood, interviewing those old stars that he knows, and he's going, these people are worthless. Every time I ask them, they go, well, my fan base and uh, my entire persona has been affected by the Manson murders. They're not giving you hard evidence. Tom's known he's going to have to go through the blue side. He's going to be getting in touch with old investigators. And one of Tom's big questions off the start from just someone who's thinking critically about the murder, big question was, how was the FBI unaware of the plan of Manson if he was under watch since he was 17 years old? Like, this is a master plan. This is some Shakespearean judicial courtroom for the masses. Like, a, if he was 17 and doing drugs his whole life, he would have had to been planning this thing the whole time. And the FBI, who was supposed to be watching these terrorists didn't pick it up you know the fbi is not really protected serve they're in trap and they just entrap people polanski's account who he was able to get in touch with stuck out to tom and it was written like a director as he is like i said there was jello caked blood on the walls and my wife and her womb was spread out like it was super duper friggin gore and graphic they didn't have <laughs> the netflix the murder porn that everyone watches now so this was too much on the hearts of the old ladies in the 70s i talked to my mom about it and her mother who's like a real 50s mom sundays you're eating dinner at three o'clock after church she is scared to death she thinks charles manson literally was the antichrist so it works it really did work for the people who were on the glass teat as stephen king said the television train one of the early investigative trends that o'neill came around doesn't really mean much was that the increase of home alarms and cameras increased after the attack like <laughs> that would be the really stupid theory was this all orchestrated by big home security Obviously not, but Tom is going, this is more hard evidence than anything one of those actors were able to tell me. He even met with Tina Sinatra, Frank Sinatra's daughter, and she described the time of the tone of the city in L.A. was fear. Everybody was scared after the attacks. They were self-isolating without a pandemic. Hugh Hefner was also interviewed, but he was like, no comment. Go talk to some old reporters. They definitely have more information, but I do not need to put my two cents and ruin my legacy. Peter Bart was an old reporter that O'Neill got in touch with early on, and he told him that Manson was more plugged into Hollywood than people will like to admit. And our third chapter, I think our next one, is all about him trying to infiltrate the Beach Boys. And the first major player that Tom got an interview with was the Vincent Bugliosi. And he was able to go to his house in Pasadena, beautiful mansion-like house. How do you afford this on a public servant salary? One of the things Bugliosi was up for, um, <laughs> was running for part of the Reagan campaign, I'm pretty sure it was. So they're like, we need to publicize this guy. He could be the president in 10 short years if he wins this monumental court case. Tom goes to his house in Pasadena. The first meeting lasted six hours, and they had no contention. You think about it, these guys are up against each other. And guys like Bugliosi know that reporters will turn on you quick. So he was able to keep the quorum for six hours. This guy's pretty good. If you look at old pictures of Bugs, he's, like, suited up. Girls are loving him just as much as they, as they love the Manson side. It was a court case of influence over the hearts and the minds of young American girls. The Bugliosi guy, his wife kept chiming into the conversation, pumping up his tires. He's a fast-talking guy. Before the interview, Tom O'Neill looked into his backstory. For whatever reason, Bugliosi, before he got to the main stage and was in the limelight, he was like... He had a police record of stalking his mailman and some other women in the town. It was the milkman. Maybe his wife was uh, getting the extra milk delivery by the milkman. Whatever it was, why are you trying to be a public servant, you friggin' creep? 
And in that six-hour first day, he let slip that one time he saw a tape. The FBI had tapes of Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski making love. That's a wild enough... You could write a book about that, how you could blackmail people if you just get video of the stars making love or whatever. Pretty fucking wild. Tom knows that if you talk to Bugliosi enough, this guy's got loose lips. And he reread Helter Skelter, just trying to find any sort of inconsistency that Bugliosi had. Maybe it was ghost written, but it seemed like he was pretty in tune with the story. One of the interesting things he found out again from Bugs was that Paramount Pictures let Polanski stay on their lot as soon as he flew back from... He was filming a movie in Europe about killing the president at the time. So Paramount Pictures flies him home and puts him up while his house is full of blood. They don't obviously clean it up for the first 48 hours. Again, an interesting thing to Tom was... The picture-perfect scene, it was full of MDMA, hash, pot, cocaine, LSD, and international director's bodies sprawled out on the floor. So they were having a blood orgy of their own. After his conversation with Bugliosi, he sees it was a very evident narrative that it's crazy drug-addicted killer teens come into the suburbs and kill a... A family, <laughs> like a mother, but obviously she was a pregnant and doing MDMA. It's much more nuanced than Bugs or the media will have you see. Tom was able to talk to Sharon's friend, and she was saying how Polanski was always bossing her around. They didn't have that great of a relationship, just a lot more information that he doesn't know is going to be useful later on. So Tom O'Neill has a couple people he could go back to for long-term interviews, but he was able to find a gold herring. Like, he found this old L.A. reporter. The guy's name was Doyle, who's out in Arizona growing marijuana. <laughs> Tom O'Neill tells him, I th I'm thinking of investigating Hank Fine, you know, one of those old detectives, the 21 detectives who were put on the case. 21 detectives were assigned, and they didn't figure out shit. Doyle's like, you, you want to investigate Hank Fine, one of the most trusted detectives in America? You are going to put a P.I. on a P.I.? You might as well swallow the shotgun and pull the trigger yourself, Tom. Doyle let Tom know that generations, 30 years of reporters have lost their jobs investigating this case. He's saying, tread very lightly, but here's a tip. Look into who was supplying the MDMA for both Spawn Ranch and Polanski. Hmm, do they have the same supplier? It's pretty cool. Um, I mean, in China, communist China, thousands of reporters go missing a year. So it's only the right topics in America that'll make you go missing. I love my life. I love this podcast. I'm not going to mysteriously go missing after this show, okay, everybody? I'm not investigating. This is the disclaimer to my FBI agent. That's about it for our Aura of Danger. You guys see where it's at. Tom O'Neill has a lead, and he actually did find that MDMA dealer over in Vegas. This takes us to Chapter 3. It is called The Golden Penetrators. People are trying to untangle the rat's nest of the Tate's house murder. And you said, like I said, 21 detectives couldn't figure out much, and they had four months to do it. <laughs> you think the bodies got stale? It's 48 hours, not four months, guys. Bugliosi, the reason he was able to afford that Pasadena mansion was because he made millions off of the bestseller Helter Skelter and it was turned into a movie. So that's probably the reason the wife was loving him so much. He was like made into a star after all of this for what? Being a lawyer for an indigent defender? That's a constitutional right, sir. You don't get millions for that. Bugliosi and the MDMA dealer, so one of the guys on the cop side and the drug dealer, both turned Tom O'Neill to the music executive, Terry Welcher, who uh, I think it was a Columbia, Columbia Records. I don't definitely don't want to slander them, so forget that. <laughs> Terry Welcher, he promised Manson record deals, and <laughs> apparently Charles Manson would torment Terry Welcher, he would, like, go there and throw eggs at his house and have naked girls in his van and be like, you can't touch any of this, Terry, give me a fucking music deal, like you promised. So he told Tom that he had met with Manson a total of three times, and the last two times were before the murders. That's what Terry Welcher said. 
Manson also wrote about creepy crawling, which was when he would take a group of his people and break into people he didn't like's houses. So you know Welcher's house was creepy crawled up and down. And Terry Welcher, this is him on the record saying, I had only ever met Charles Manson three times two of which were two months before the murder. He's going, I never saw Manson after the Tate murders. He get, he went missing. So he says, Terry Melcher was very close with Dennis Wilson. He signed the drummer for the Beach Boys. And so he linked up Manson and uh, Dennis Wilson. And they became really big mutual friends. They bought a house, more so Melcher, because Manson was absolutely poor on the Pacific Palisades. It had 31 rooms. This is an absolute estate. They would have 17 women in the house at a time. They went through hundreds of thousands of dollars in drugs every month, hundreds of thousands of dollars probably in gonorrhea medication. At this time period, apparently, Manson helped Dennis Wilson co-write Cease to Exist, one of the Beach Boys' best songs. And so L.A. and the mainstream without Melcher's help, is starting to learn Manson's name. And this is, again, before the era of social media, he was able to get bigger than the corporate media, which is wild and has to be derailed. So Manson and Wilson adopt a third for the party house, Greg Jacobs, another musician at the time. And what they do to up the clout even more is they paint a car in gold, pure gold and drive around LA picking up women (laughs) and get known as they get a reputation driving around town all day picking up chicks as the golden penetrators (laughs) so Wilson he got sick pretty quick of putting up everybody in the mansion and he's going Manson is way too scary to throw out this guy will wipe his ass with an eviction notice and so the other two guys within a few months wind up leaving out and Charlie has a uh, what was it a 30 room mansion to himself it did get foreclosed on eventually and by august of 1968 that was when he took all those people over to the spawn ranch and so he moves to the ranch he's no longer in the orbit of somebody who has already seen mainstream success wilson you know was manson's best shot at stardom this is when they say he starts really trapping girls out and running firearms even from the spawn ranch So Melcher did not have a great relationship with him. He did check on Manson again before the murders. He says, interesting thing with the Golden Boys, (laughs) Uh, Golden Girls, Golden Boys. Rudy Altabelli was a guy that owned a house on Cielo Drive. He was one of the first openly gay men in Hollywood. That's how he was able to afford such a nice house. And Tom met with him at Musso and Frank Grill. This is like out of a Tarantino movie. The guy shows up with pink rose tinted glasses. He's 80 years old, still effeminate, going, how do I look, Tom? And he dropped some super knowledge on Tom. Apparently, somebody rented his house out on Cielo Drive during the times of the murders, and it was signed under Golden P Industries, maybe the Golden Penetrators. One of those guys rented the house on Cielo Drive. So they really might have been able to scope out this murders, or maybe they were just getting in with their MDMA dealer and Polanski. You know, this is a tight web if you you know if you have the same drug dealer as another person you're gonna run into each other from time to time and they have (laughs) we're not there yet state drug dealers so everyone wanted to stay on the street after the murders like the week after elvis presley stayed on cielo drive this is probably why they shut it down (laughs) i would have created my own traffic there i would have bought my own legal pad and a friggin (laughs) microscope or whatever to the crime scene i would have been doing my own investigation baby tom he is thinking he's at a bit of a dead end here he's meeting with people who are just saying yeah i rented it out it's all circumstantial evidence desperate as he is he pays a guy off of mansonfamilymurders.com this is in the year 2000 super sketchy website it didn't go to a nigerian prince He actually received redacted investigative reports. They were alluding to the fact that there was information within the Bureau about the Tate and LaBianca murders being premeditated. So again, remember the official report by the police chief saying, these murders have nothing to do with each other. It was a total shot in the dark. It will never happen again. 
within the bureau they were sending emails to each other faxes at the time going this is a new trend for sure should we tell the people no so Altabelli, the older gayer gentleman who owned uh, property on CLO Drive, got to take Tom up there. He got to see it around himself. Tom was like, the entire house has been destroyed. There's an Italian marble-columned mansion now where it used to be. There's hella ghosts there, I bet. And also, funny tip that isn't in the final report, Helter Skelter, was Bulioso also had a criminal record for stalking Altabelli. He needs to chill down. His private investigator is getting a little too much action. Bulios, he's a snoop, and he's got a criminal record that got covered up. Now you know about the Golden Penetrators and Manson's attempt at mainstream success. Brings us to Chapter 4, The Holes in Helter Skelter going out right with it. So a developing question for Tom and his investigation, like some of the dumber controversies or absurdisms are starting to just hit him in the face as he learns more facts about the crime. So if Manson is the mastermind kill orderer, he's the godfather, why would he choose a kill virgin, Susan Atkins and some kid from Texas, to perform one of the biggest murders of the century? (laughs) That would be the dumbest order ever. Of the smoking guns in Helter Skelter, he had to convince Bugliosi about this one. And so Tom is getting closer. It's been almost two to five years he's investigating at this point. He gets close with one of the guys in the DA office who lets him know off the record, which he then puts on the record in his own book. He had like 60 pages of notes at the end. DA let him know that Melcher is full of shit. The guy that was saying, I've only ever seen Manson three times. Yeah, I might have offered him a deal early on. That guy is an absolute liar. And it turns out... Melcher was at the Spawn Ranch after the murder. So this guy was still, maybe he was just going there for a horseback ride. Maybe he was going there for the prostitutes and the drugs. But he said to Tom O'Neill that I had never seen Manson again. And at that meeting, he was actually like, go go talk to Bugliosi. I don't know anything. He's my investigative reporter. He's rubbing his temples, just trying to get this reporter out of his house. So Melcher is an absolute fucking liar. He cannot be trusted even though he has been on the record a bunch of times. And one of the things in Helter Skelter, Bugliosi was going, I have cited over a million police reports for this book. (laughs) And like we just said, um, Tom O'Neill, who spent 20 years, only had 60 pages of sources. How do you find a million things? The guy at the DA office told Tom, most of the evidence on the case has been destroyed. And what do we know about history? It's written by the winners. You destroy evidence. If you don't want something getting out, destroy the evidence. Why else would you have an incentive to get rid of it? There's a motive on itself. This DA guy is really coming in clutch. He even let Tom into an evidence locker. You're not allowed to do this. He got to see all the cocaine that the LAPD confiscates and then probably throws a banger for their Christmas party. Real snow. In the evidence locker, Tom found a long legal pad that used to be Bugliosi's when he was interviewing one of the key witnesses for the case. A legal pad from a lawyer during one of the biggest cases. That is legitimate gold to an investigator. A big witness in that pad was Danny DiCarlo. This guy was just a biker that frequented Spawn Ranch. He was probably trafficking drugs, they said, through the Hells Angels. One of the ways that Agent Smith later on got (laughs) Charles Manson involved in like uh, meth and speed was he crossed over the Manson family with the Hells Angels who were both terrorizing Northern California during the summer of love so he crossed over he polluted the hallucinogenic movement with the speed scene which you see took over the 70s and the serial killers popped up (laughs) so on this pad DiCarlo let Vince Bugliosi know that the music producer, Melcher, went to the ranch after the murder. Again, what we heard from the DA before. So absolutely crazy stuff. The pad also said that Melcher admitted to his attorney this was supposed to be confidential, but now a reporter has it. Terry Melcher not only was at Spawn Ranch after and lied to Tom, but he was actually taking acid with Charlie at Spawn Ranch. And the FBI has pictures of him on his knees and they were like dancing in the meadow and just going totally nuts. (laughs) Not exactly incriminating, but this guy 
lied. He perjured himself in court during one of the biggest court cases ever. The first few years of Tom's story investigation is wrapping up. He is aware that Vincent Bugliosi has put a tail on him. So his habit of following people has not quelled at all. He has ramped it up, especially with Tom. He puts a slur campaign on Tom towards the end of the book. That's libel, baby. And to end this chapter, you won't have to remember his name now anymore. Terry Melcher, the music executive who almost signed Charlie, he died super prematurely when Tom was investigating him at 62. And Tom was going, his death foreclosed a lot. It seemed like the end of the case for me, but I had to move on. He wrote the story really well. It was paced well. Suggest the read. This takes us to chapter five. It is called L.A. County's Sheriff's Office. A little criminal justice calamity. Within a year, Tom has already interviewed 500 victims, witnesses, journalists, cops, judges for this case. In a year, 500 people. His one-bedroom apartment in Venice Beach has turned into a shrine for Manson. It's like a psychedelic spider web on a whiteboard. What was that? Sunny in Philadelphia where Charlie's got all the strings pointing around the room and it looks like his hair is standing on edge. Mr. O'Neill is fully down the rabbit hole. One of these side projects, side investigations he was getting into was this guy Hinman was a black politician in Southern California with the, he kind of did some marching along with the Black Panthers and he was getting big quick. Upon his murder, of course this guy got murdered, the words political piggy was written in blood on the walls. I don't think I mentioned that before, that was like the biggest thing. They wrote pig in uh, Sharon Tate's blood on the walls. So again, to further sow that division of crazy drug addicted teens versus suburban parents. And Tom thinks he found some sort of ties how... Helter Skelter, they were saying that Charles Manson was trying to push a race war. Of course, it was his family. He ordered another hit on Hinman to kill this black politician who was rising very quick. This was obviously not his M.O. He was trying to tune out together was his thing, and apparently they tried to manipulate it into a a racial epithet like... um, I'm trying to stamp around it, but what happened to this entire summer? Floyd and Chauvin knew each other for 20 years. That is not an accident. Tom found more DA evidence that the L.A. sheriffs were saying that um, the three murders now were connected. Within these four months, people are going crazy in the streets, very scared, and they didn't tell anybody that they have a lead. Some of the hidden evidence that was not made out of public or was even in the court case, was that Spawn Ranch where, you know, they said the killers were down in Baker on on a totally different playing field. Eight days after the kill, there was a full raid on the Spawn Ranch, August 16th of 1969. And they say the raid had nothing to do with the murders and they didn't really come up with anything positive. So much misinformation going on here. What the detectives should have been doing, they had 21 of the best detectives in the nation on this, would be building a case. When you no-knock raid someone, they have the ability to sue you back. The DA, once again coming in clutch, this guy got Tom the most reliable cops number he knew. Goes by the name of Charlie Gunther, who refused to tell Tom over the phone what he wanted. He insisted they were being bugged. This guy probably had a life worth of paranoia and it has manifested in his old age tom drives a hundred plus miles out to victorville and this guy is a hero in the true crime world mr gunther he alluded to over the phone that the evidence was destroyed you need to come over here he was apparently at the autopsies of the tate and la cienega murders he said the stabbing definitely looked connected it was like um what all these killer shows, <laughs> a serial killer has his signature. They always leave their mark on the crime scene. The way they stabbed the guts, the way it came out, definitely looked connected. Even more evidence that the cops knew these murders had something to do with each other. Gunther also had a wire audio from the Manson family at the time, and this was seen as a smoking gun by Bugliosi. They can spin anything the way they want, but read it to another layer. Manson, again, on the Spawn Ranch, being surveilled, said, 
man, what if we recreate that Tate thing to free some of our people in jail by leaving a sign, man? If he's saying, what if we recreate, he's probably didn't order that first hit, which you can make it say in a courtroom, see, he proposed a murder. You can retroactively draw those lines together to a dumber jury. In reality, Manson saw the news story and he's like, damn, someone wiling up in the hills. I need to, maybe we should have done something like that. It could be a deep state placing this on him. <laughs> Imagine that watching a developing story on the uh, news while you've been sitting home all day. A man had robbed a bank downtown and you're watching the live updates. It gets to 9 p.m. It turns out it was Nick, the guy sitting on his couch that robbed the bank. That's what's about to happen to Manson. In 1971, <laughs> Tom is, like, grasping at straws at this point because, again, he's talking to all the police. These are all the official records you can find. So what do you do when official records aren't enough? Tom tunes into some old conspiratorial radio shows. And in 1971, there was this guy called Gilroy, one of the first to call bullshit on the murders two years after, and he was already saying something is not adding up here. Tom is printing out the transcripts of his old shows. These guys would report the actual death numbers of Vietnam, and he covered the Manson activity daily and the Spawn Ranch crime before because he had his own police blotter. This is like the OG truther show. This radio show is legendary. Tom is thinking this guy does more than the 21 detectives that were put on the case did. The radio host estimated that the ranch raid a week later, so even this guy, it took 70 years for the public to know the ranch was raided. This radio host knew within a week. <laughs> he was saying the raid was so the police can cover their tracks and look like they were on the ball with the Mansons. They are building the narrative without anybody else knowing. There are a couple steps ahead is the point. Like I mentioned before, how the FBI coaxes people into making goddamn bombs. You're entrapping and covering up tracks. Tom is thinking this is looking more and more like a cover-up. <laughs> and it doesn't look good when some crackpot radio host is the most accurate truth that you've found. But the biggest thing he cares about, and the biggest thing someone who cares about truth is, a backlog proving your tyrannical predictions correct and that's exactly what he did day by day with the murders and the LAPD was out there saying these murders have nothing to do with each other and this guy in live time in the 1960s with no insider jobs or anonymous hacking government computers he is able to find all the information you need to <laughs> also in the uh, DA records at this time during those four months, you would have think um, Manson would have been detained if they suspected him for the murders. He was up in Big Sur, and he got arrested for Grand Theft Auto. Which, why did he get let free for Grand Theft Auto within a year when he has a rap sheet of a criminal record? It's because, Tom proves later, Manson had a justice immunity idol. He, was, he had a get-out-of-jail-free card. And this was a conspiracy within the sheriff's records office. How does someone get let go? I'm pretty sure the Clintons were passing the crime bill at this time. Like, if you had three strikes, you're out. You're a super predator. Manson had 300 strikes, motherfucker. Helter Skelter even, Bugliosi, our prosecuting attorney, the guy we should trust, said that Manson was living at the ranch all the way through September. Which is very false, considering there's an arrest record of him in Big Sur. O'Neill feels like he's stumbling across some ancient, forgotten bureaucracy. Literally, El Dorado. It's like a city of gold for the case that he's building. He's proving where people are, the timestamps, and who they are interacting with. Tom, he's on a good path. He trusts his gut with another retired cop. This guy was called Lou Watnick. He's living out in Thousand Oaks. Tom played out his case for Lee Watnick, and the guy was like, this is chicken shit. You know this goes ten times deeper than what you've been discovering, Tom. The raid alone was twice the size, and the crimes that he was released on were always worse. Grand Theft Auto, he probably had a pound of cocaine in the back of the car, too. He was trafficking stolen vehicles off the ranch, it turned out as well. So Lewis said... 
when something like this happens, remember this guy's a cop, when someone in the criminal justice system gets let in and out so many times, he is either ratting info on people every time he gets arrested, or he's on somebody else's snitch list and he is being controlled like a puppet because he is the conduit you know, to the black markets, again, he is the hippie side to that MDMA dealer. You have to control every level of the corporation of crime. It's like um, Al Capone started during bootlegging. It's because the government is knows that people are still going to drink. So they're like, Al Capone, you uh, do our taxes and uh, maybe you get to make some moonshine of your own. It's a criminal network where you have to control everybody in it. You ever seen Al Capone's prison cell? It's nicer than my apartment. <laughs> Jesus. Tom also found in this El Dorado of the criminal justice calamity, <laughs> Charles Manson marched with Malcolm X. So why would this guy be trying to start a race war when he's out there marching for equity and love? It doesn't quite add up. Tom's whiteboard is starting to make a lot more sense, and his paranoia that he is being watched is on the double. Chapter 6. Who was... Reeve Whitson. This guy's a spook. He's a ghost writer. He's a pseudonym. That's who he is. There is no smoking gun at this point. He's found some gold up in the DA lockers. But there are mountains of circumstantial evidence surrounding this house of cards. Tom started reading up on informants. Who are informants? They are a spook, like a uh, an agent, a secret agent, a 007 and at this time, Tom made sure to include in his book, he still believed that JFK was murdered by a lone assassin and that we had been to the moon a few weeks before these murders went down. <laughs> Big distraction from another hoax, maybe, like the uh, Coro... You know what I'm trying to say. I just don't want to get kicked off this platform. Whitson, or at least the name Reeve Whitson, the death certificate was produced in 1994. And one of the cops that O'Neill had been working with correlated the name as an undercover FBI agent. <laughs> a couple other informants, though, were telling him that the guy was CIA. Tom met with all of Ree Whitson's close friends, too, throughout the city. And they were like, yeah, he would disappear for months at a time. We never really got to hear what he did for a living. This guy was a goddamn spy. And uh, his, like, wife and daughter lived over in Sweden, and apparently when he did get discharged, he tried to bring them over to America, but then he died prematurely, it went off, or maybe he was epstein maybe he got sent to his own friggin' island and just gets death in the media. So one sheriff told him that Reeve lived eight lives at a time. This guy had one of the highest profiles, but was always able to fly under the radar. Kind of like Manson always getting arrested, but <laughs> being able to go around the country with immunity. Richard Edlund was able to go on the record for Tom saying that Reeve was on the CIA payroll. So even the in the intelligence community, the CIA will use the FBI payroll as a cover-up. They'll use the NSA, they'll use each other just to throw off the line of investigation so you do look like a person with the red yarn. Richard Edlund went on the record. He's saying, I'll go to jail over this. The, this guy was on the CIA payroll. We worked together. Neil Cummings was apparently an author that knew this guy since 1984. And the guy talked about killing people firsthand to him. So he's a spy with loose lips. No wonder this guy got off pretty early. This buddy Cummings also said that Reeve was at the 150 murder house on Cielo the days following the death. Why? This guy doesn't have security clearance. Like, when you have the super badge, you could say, we're taking it over from here, boys. And you could go into any crime scene in the nation. Guy worked out of the Pasadena Playhouse. You know, where else would you get your CIA actors? They got to do some acting classes of their own if they're going to play a million roles on the globe. Eight lives at once. Another hole in Helter Skelter Tom found was that there was a ghost writer contributor to Helter Skelter, and it was rumored to be CIA, so potentially Reeve Whitson. Tom also was talking about, I found a murder story that really closely resembled the Himner, the black politician murder, <laughs> like word for word. It was just a fiction, putting up air quotes, type of story, and it was by R.W., <laughs> Not only that, the ties get worse with Reeve Whitson. He was friends with Colonel Tate. Sharon Tate's dad was a colonel in the army. How many army colonels do you know 
that can afford a mansion in the hills of Hollywood. They had their own little golden triangle, Reeve Whitson, Agent 007, Colonel Tate. They were friends with General Curtis LeMay. Even if you know like the American indoctrination history they teach you in school, Curtis LeMay bravely captained the USS Maddox around the Vietnam Peninsula until 1964. We were fired on without will by the Vietnamese people who have rafts, so you know we got to invade them. <laughs> the USS Maddox was proven not to have even been in the Gulf of Tonkin at this time. Colonel Tate knows a thing or two about false flags. Could that have happened within the house of his daughters? Reeve Whitson is what investigators call a walk-in. It opened a door of dirty connections. And that takes us to Chapter 7. We are getting deep. It is called Counterintelligence. Tom knows you can't just write a book about a hitman's name, Reeve Whitson. That's not enough. That's super circumstantial. So he gets in touch with ex-agent Preston Gilroy again, and he let Tom know that Rit Weaveson, this guy had a Panther affiliation. And this opened up another <laughs> rabbit hole for Tom. He starts putting in Freedom of Information Request Acts, which takes six months at a time for them to give you the information to probably make sure there's nothing too truthful in it. This is why it took Tom 20 years to write a book like this. He found out that Reeve Whitson was involved with the FBI's COINTELPRO, which stands for Counterintelligence Program, which was stated the mission statement is to infiltrate and program potential Manson ties in coordination with the CIA's Operation Chaos. So the FBI and the CIA are both working together to try to subvert movements you've heard of agent provocateurs or counter opposition within a movement started in the 60s imagine this wasn't the classified you'd be looking at anderson cooper on the news this guy's supposed to be giving you the news he cried about a trump tweet last week how do you watch a news anchor cry in front of you if cronkite was crying while guys were getting their arms blown off in vietnam <coughs> people would have left america a very long time ago Maybe you've heard of Operation Mockingbird, which that one has never had an end date. Usually when they declassify, they say the end date, which means it just got a new name. Operation Mockingbird, Operation Midnight Climax, these are non-linear warfare objectives. It's, it's like a disinformation campaign on your own people. You know the Russian, how we said they have bots controlling our media, they're influencing our election. You see they have fucking military-grade predator drones circling the city of Minneapolis now. So a little taste of destabilization being to the, bought to the home front in America. May of 1960 was the UC Berkeley riots when the students saw the development of the shadow government. They saw we were good <laughs> those very kids were about to be drafted to Vietnam. And so they started protesting what was known in the intelligence community as Black Friday. You know, the Black Friday is the known in the public as the 1920s when the market crashed. The intel has their own Black Friday, which was when people started thinking for themselves. So now, Tom thinks he has a, his own past, an incentive to search for how many times the government has lied. Because it opens up more of these Reeve Whitson holes that connect to your story. He goes back even deeper. Since 1956, the OSS, before that it was called the War Department, man. I'm saying these things change names every few years. The OSS stated that their goal was to increase factionalism, which is the exact definition of chaos in the COINTELPRO. Like we've said on the show, we've dissected it, it's going to be coming in further books. A capable empire doesn't want a united rah-rah populace. They need people that are blind and infighting. And their stated goals, even to today, and you see it, it's so obvious if you pay attention, it's to increase factionalism. You think the 90s kids, like I had black, Indian, Asian friends growing up, who the fuck was racist my age? They Literally, the media is reviving it in front of our very eyes, just like they tried to do with Helter Skelter's narrative. There were race riots of the 60s. How did I not bring that up before? And at the time of the 60s, the ex at that time, their current objective, the COINTELPRO schematic said to cultivate solid informants by commuting prison sentences. 
Does that sound like Charles Manson? Maybe he was giving up information every time that he was arrested and had his prison sentences shortened. That's the exact definition. On the simple scale, it's ratting, but when the intelligence community does it, they're really just building a further criminal web that they have their hand in. This guy Eldridge Cleaver was given control to the Panthers ministry, Black Panthers, for a while. Guy was also on the CIA payroll, and he shot two cops in a protest. So exactly what I said before, Agent Provocateurs, Eldridge Cleaver, is the crispest addicts of fucking subverting actual grassroots movements. And just like the COINTELPRO, he knew he was going to be have his sentence commuted, he was able to kill someone and delegitimize a movement without going to jail. It's a win-win for the intel community that'll squash out a Black Friday quick. Tom even found records of one agent who was credited with 2,300 actions to discredit <laughs> grassroots movements. So they get like uh, accolades, little medals on their chest when they fuck with uh, the people who are getting pepper sprayed at Occupy Wall Street. And to further go along, because you see the Black Panthers are making a revival in 2020, the infiltrative mission statement was to make them non-sympathetic to mild leftists. So if you are not breaking, if you are not looting, you are not with us. You have to be this radicalized to be with us. Again, they're factionalizing people. In 1968, an illegal domestic surveillance program again on Manson showed him inviting the Black Panthers to the Spawn Ranch. So again, why would he be trying to start a race war when he knows, man, he has this tiny little gang of s slutty hi hippies? Why would you go against the Black Panthers? This thing is that they are minorities who are armed. He's not going to stand a chance. He knows he has to be good with this people. He's trying to do business with them. And for Tom O'Neill, this guy, another ex-LAPD, Will Herman, was able to draw the connection from CIA to LAPD. There was a thing called Operation Phoenix, which took ex-Viet Cong officers. This was under order of Reagan in California. They were taking people who were especially cruel to the Korean people during the war, doing, you know, a Malai massacre to the North Koreans. And bringing them and giving them officer positions in the uh, LAPD. It becomes clear to Tom that the narrative of the DA has all those records, if we're able to put it all together, will never be released to the public. And that's the reason you have to put these court cases up. We need a story to feel like justice was served and there was an end to this. <laughs> Got chapter 8 here. It's going to be a quicker one. It's called The Lawyer Swap. This is when Sharon Atkins, the uh, Susan Atkins, the proposed murderer, got basically coached during her time getting ready for trial. And she wrote a manifesto it comes out that was most likely written by Reeve Whitson again. Bugliosi, not just full of shit when you're talking to him in person, but he perjured himself on the stands again talking about subversive militants and he has nothing to do with that when in that <laughs> long legal pad that Tom found it was going so we're gonna have subversive militants go into these programs and frame Manson for all of it every generation has their fall guy I wonder what the real story is behind Benedict Arnold guy's supposed to be the biggest traitor in history <laughs> there's people doing a lot worse even within 40 years ago you see during the trial, one of the things that Bugliosi was trying to put on Manson was their initiation to the ranch was that Manson would cut people's ears off with a long sword. Why would you let this guy do this? He apparently did it once and they caught it on camera. And so now <laughs> that he's uh, ready to take the fall for everybody, can they start using all the evidence that they've collected over the years and trump it up? Whereas for 50 years, every single thing he did was minimalized and... They let him go. So that shows even if you do cut a deal with the state, eventually they will use you as their fall man. Maybe they really did choke Jeffrey Epstein out, and that's what you get. You get to live the high life for a while, corrupt people, and then they off you when they don't need you anymore. Tom is realizing with this COINTEL Pro, with the lawyer swap, <laughs> they literally swapped out lawyers at the last minute, swapped their testimony. You're not allowed to do any of that. You have to, like, file... There's a whole lot of paperwork when you want to be switching attorneys. And 50 years after any murder, infuriating to an investigator, details become irrelevant. 
and Tom is saying here, look at the details. The details are all written down. He just is saying the narrative takes over after a certain amount of time. That's why you're allowed to declassify stuff. It's been 50 years. Those were other people. That was their narrative. Even though the program was never continued. This was a absolute bombshell when Susan Atkins was detained for the murder she said on november 17th during that four month holding period when the police department was putting the story together and we land on the moon and shit she proclaimed to an officer i know who did the murders you know the girl who did the 28 stabs herself she says i think i know who did it in confidence to her lawyer they switch out that lawyer immediately to this new guy gerald condon who's Legal records span November from November of uh, 1969 to November of 1971. Like, that was the end of his legal career. Maybe another spook. They just set her up with a fake-ass attorney. So this was a completely stacked trial. Again, we said maybe while Manson was in jail for a while, they tried they fried his brain. It definitely looks like it. But they let Atkins and uh, Manson re-meet up with each other while they were shackled and so they ran to each other embraced each other i haven't seen you in over a year and a half and it's like so they weren't even on the ranch together at that time as the official story goes and they take the pictures of manson and atkins hugging and they're going killer and mind washed person both together can you see their connection is uh murderous the spin was at an all-time high for this lady she did not get a fair trial but who cares in America? They also took Manson's right to defend himself. That's one of the original 10 Bill of Rights. I think it's the six, what is it? The Sixth Amendment, the right to a just attorney. You can defend yourself if you want. They took away that constitutional right from him. Tom thinks as people further discard the details, our best chance to have known the truth was lost in November of 1969 when that DA put Atkins' testimony on lockdown. Sad stuff, but sometimes the truth gets buried in history, and you gotta have someone like Tom who was gonna go back and untangle the rat's tail. Chapter 9, Manson's get-out-of-jail-free card. We kind of know his deal here. Tom, again, almost a decade into this case, is learning why it takes so long, those FOIA requests. Entertainment Magazine now is barking up his tree, saying it looks like you got a pretty hefty story there. What do you think? But Tom's mind is already going, this is book material. He found some more of these get-out-of-jail-free cards. They're pretty fun. June 4th of 1969, Charles Manson was pulled over on the PCH at 3.30 a.m., and he ran at a cop with gyrating arms. That is the definition of suicide by cop. You can't just run at them with your arms like a chainsaw. He would have been in jail. You know, anybody would have been shot by this in 2020. 1969, you could try to dig a little bit deeper on this one. This was when, again, he was getting into the speed scene. And so, or the speed scene was being pushed onto him. Who, who else, even if you are high and driving, you're not going to charge at a man with a gun. You only do that type of shit if you're an, on Adderall or Ritalin or meth. Very cool backdoor Tom found that Atkins and Manson at a time, had the same attorney in Oregon at different times individually. But the guy's name, another fucking Whitson, M.E. Madison. He was able to get Charles off for more than just a 3 a.m. cop charge. And he also was uh, there for Atkins, so maybe Atkins was part of this underbelly as well. This was a chapter with pictures. So there really wasn't that much going on. They had pictures of some of the officers, the 007s you're about to learn about undercover in hippie clothing and you could tell it's like an older guy who's just trying to schmooze in definitely would suggest the book for this chapter he got into the summer of love a little bit for us and how manson was being let out of the prisons there summer of love you hear about it all the time was 1967 to 68 and manson got his property at the hate just in time hey asbury up in northern california roger smith Two was a co-signer on the house. How convenient. He was running the Haight-Asbury Medical Clinic. Smith was apparently pulling some strings behind the scene for Manson to make sure he was never indefinitely detained for his many crimes and dealings up in that city during the time. He was also arrested in Berkeley during the Summer of Love. 
there must there was no internet how did they have this guy like did he have a secret tattoo where you have a get out of jail free card i'm just gonna start bringing a fucking monopoly card around with me they say if you make a cop laugh he'll let you go i'm gonna start handing them get out of jail free <laughs> prop huber for pullovers also during that summer big deal when it comes to this case in 1968 LSD was made illegal to possess in the United States. You know, before this, it used to be a pharmaceutical. Doctors used to prescribe you to take it. I mean, it does help people get rid of chronic depression 50% of the time. So uh, maybe we're going to see history repeat. That could happen again, and the, the movement will be subverted, and we go round and round on the history's merry-go-round. <laughs> and after 1968, Roger Smith and the DA only had one client on his Rolodex, one guy that he was supporting, Charles Manson. I mean, this guy does get arrested every week, so he is a handful, but this is absolutely unheard of. It's kind of like Emmy Madison and that other attorney who had a two-week-long career. That's not fishy. And in between that summer of love, there was a big story. Manson wrote about taking a bus full of girls down to Florida to explore, find some new followers. That was a five-month dark period on the police records so they tried to pin like a mass bus murder that happened at the time on him again he is the fall man but he gets that get out of jail free card until the piper comes to collect its toll and we're getting there this is chapter 10 brings us to the hate asbury free medical clinic so that house that manson was able to acquire up in the hate was at 558 clayton street you wonder if that one's still locked off too but this was Charlie's castle, full of ladies, Charlie's angels. <laughs> they had rooms of vibrant paint full of naked women. The, and the ladies at this time were referring to him as JC, or sometimes Christ for short. He had the long hair, he fit the part, he had some scary good charisma that, again, the state wanted to figure out how, if we could have even half of the Manson mojo, our soldiers wouldn't be defecting. And one of the big, because uh, this guy was under surveillance 24-7 at this point, they tried to get Manson on heroin, but he had a deathly aversion to needles. He absolutely detested them. And so <laughs> they were able to get him on meth in the later years. But you see, the opioid epidemic in America could have started much earlier had this guy got a generation of kids hooked on heroin. But now we got the state shipping in fentanyl from China. 100 times stronger than heroin. <laughs> Again, who was the MDMA supplier? Toward the end of the Spawn Ranch days, they said that Manson was uh, rumored to go on multi-day bingers. And you could barely even do that with LSD. You would have to double your dose every single day. So they were saying this guy was for sure cranked out towards the end. <laughs> One of... Back in the hate, like, um, the, he was a fucking local legend. One of his... Um, sayings were if you love everything you don't need to think about what bothers you man very very optimistic point of view but that really doesn't work too well when you're talking to a da agent who's coked up trying to sell meth yeah, yeah, yeah. so how do we get rich off of love charlie it's never gonna happen this guy has served his purpose enough he corralled the people and now you can insert a new head Roger Smith, the man of many tools. He was another eight live type of guy. So does this mean cats are superior to CIA agents with eight lives to a cat's nine? Roger Smith was also published in the Journal of Psychedelic Drugs. That popped up at a convenient time. And he tested on 16 albino people. So I don't know if that was like considered subhuman at the time. Disgusting we are in the age of eugenics back then. But if you ever heard of the fucking Geneva Convention, you are not allowed to do medical tests to a person without their approval and especially without their knowledge. Back to the beginning with Dr. Jolly West. This guy was dosing people up without them knowing. He's going against every single right you have. Think about it. Your right to your body is your most sacred thing. My body, my choice. No abortions. No fucking... Roger Smith was attacking these people's minds. That is even more sovereign than your body is pretty unethical out here and he did it with a, an unlimited budget a federal budget and the tests even from this bullshit psychedelic journal that they published was not successful they were only able to see lsd produces disorganized behavior 
but never violent. Yeah, but he's ordering hits while he's LSD'd out. You would never hurt something if you were tripping. Like, we know this. You wouldn't charge at a cop with uh, gyrating arms. This is why they got this guy on meth. This is Operation Chaos. They are subverting movements here. And uh, I don't think I mentioned it before, but it's pretty instrumental to the story. At the end of the court case, one of the most viewed cases of all time was the first time that LSD was explained to the American populace. And again, it was the same year that it was made illegal. So this was a great time to push your narrative. They were going, Charles Manson used this to brainwash people. But we don't know chicken or the egg. Obviously, the per the people that would get into a love bus with a guy that looks like Charles Manson have a pretty impressionable mind to be kind. So is it these people who found him and just wanted to have a new mindset? Or is it his charisma is so powerful combined with this psychedelic that he can't be trusted out on the streets. And that's what the my grandma believes still. <laughs> Got deeper. Tom O'Neill was talking about how at that Haight-Asbury Free Medical Clinic. This is wild. I mean, they were just testing on students because if you're in the psych unit, you're not going to stop as a nurse and look at every single person. You're in a crazy bin. So they were just shooting people up with LSD, administering doses as much as they want. This is... Real life MK Ultra. This is where it happens, baby. Tom proved it. And when this book was released, the Haight Asbury Free Medical Clinic was disbanded. And a lot of the forms, again, were destroyed, destroyed the evidence. That's some wild timing. Kind of like a lot of people Tom was talking to died along the journey. <laughs> this uh, free medical clinic was disbanded at such a convenient time. I'm a coincident theorist here. Roger Smith, with his Journal of Psychedelic Studies, was kind of like the counter to the counterculture of Woodstock was happening during the Summer of Love. So the love was spreading faster than the disinformation, and that's why you had to create a super stage to reset the narrative for the country. And so one of the later goals in the hate and those Summer of Love years was Roger and then the other guy. It could have just been Roger twice, but Dave Smith pops up, who's also publishing papers and helping do tests on people in the medical clinic. They got a slam dunk case if they can prove that this drug is addictive, which they were never able to. They tried to do a bunch of stories on that, but both these guys, Rogers and Dave, we're consistently at 558 Clayton Street, Manson's house, using the prostitutes. Smith was like, I'm doing uh, lab studies about sex trafficking. How would you do studies about that without human trials? Tom was able to get the alias of Roger Smith on the phone, and his, he knew he only had one question in the guy. I never understood how Manson was under your supervision in San Francisco while being paroled in L.A., so you can see the non-linear warfare, the COINTELPRO in action, these two, the grassroots, the people actually getting together and doing what they believe versus the people who are reading the journals and speaking out of ideology. What's the McKenna quote while we're in the theme to end the chapter? Take it easy, but take it. Chapter 11, our second to last, Mind Control. The editors are ready to publish the book. They're asking Tom, saying it looks connected to the JFK murders, you know? Maybe we get a follow-up for that. And Tom's like, Geez, JFK, what? I am definitely going double deep now on this. He tells the editors to fuck off. Tom is basically on his own. He's ready to publish this thing as a book. And he discovers one of the best characters of this entire saga, Dr. Jolly West. He just goes by Jolly up at the Haight-Asbury Clinic. And he was doing his own LSD studies far before he got to California. This guy uh, is co-authored on some studies with Roger Smith, even though they never met in person. Jolly is said to have a career in the Army. He denies being part of MK Ultra whatsoever and was diagnosed with cancer in 1998 and committed suicide. You know, two bullets to the back of the head. Suicide by the Clinton Foundation. I wonder... How many people really do commit suicide, though, after they get a cancer diagnosis? Because usually that's when people say, I found my second light. I feel like I was reborn. I value every day now. That'd be a pretty adverse effect that is counterintuitive. Unlike Reeve Whitson, who 
<laughs> talked about murdering people. One of the gross stories before that Reeve had told one of his co-workers. No, one of the people that just knew him in passing. Reeve was like, you know, I've uh, been reading some Thomas Clancy or whoever there was in the 70s novels. And I've been thinking of the worst way to torture someone to death would be to put a tube up their butt, put peanut butter on their scrotum, and release a rat inside of the tube. Okay, this guy has the most sick and twisted mind of all time. He's thinking about rats gnawing through your gooch. <laughs> Reeve Whitson, this guy was on the dark side, but Jolly actually deprogrammed prisoners in a Cornell prison program before this. So he was administering his own LSD experiments. The guy said to have taken it over a hundred times himself. And he was able to get people to not recidivize. He cured the stupidness of a fucking inmate. Like, he got people to transcend and want to escape prison, which is pretty dope. He took those studies to Texas and Oklahoma City University, I think it was. That's what this guy was doing all throughout the 50s and 60s. This is when Jolly was... Uh, had a little bit of loose lips himself, was talking about Operation Midnight Climax. Some of his counterparts, people at the CIA that he was potentially contracted with, were putting up fake whorehouses. They would put up two-way windows, and they would dose guys up who came in, put a little dissolvable hit within their drink while they came in, and uh, then you're in the room with a prostitute. While you're tripping ball sack, and now you can control this person. You have video of them. They are at... Uh, doing a little bit better research than the people over at the hate who are probably just fucking partying with college kids and he wound up being one of the people to administer the drug to people the most this guy's got a pretty good idea what he's doing and so jolly got to northern california about just in time for the summer of love 1966 there was a massive influx of middle class kids so again it's just like the college socialist demographic before used to be there for free love and jolly he got his new wardrobe he got his hair colored he had he was going undercover with all the guys he was directly in control of six grad students at the house <laughs> tom was able to get in touch with some of these kids who actually lived at fucking manson's crazy fun house where they were supposedly doing grad student work and they were like the way we would describe jolly west our supervisor as a boss his quarterly review this guy has chronic absenteeism great boss he was probably out tripping in the big sir with manson on the weekends what these kids also said, their um, boss's thesis statement for the summer was <laughs> to diagnose psychedelic patterns in counterculture. So that's what they told the kids they were doing and why there was all these free drugs everywhere. I mean, I wouldn't detest that either. What uh, Dave Smith and Roger Smith's real job description was in their psychedelic study was to define a hippie. They are literally, this is like double speak how you see now, the new normal. They were redefining hippie for the masses. They wanted to give it a scarier name. People that run up to the hills of Hollywood at the night and stab you. This was all tied together. Jolly West, unfortunately, was never successful in doing a Manson brainwash. They were never able to create the Manchurian candidate. That's what they wanted these fucking drugs for. And once they couldn't, they declared it illegal and just added to the war on drugs. Now you can make policing money off of it. They were trying to see if you could have a guy like with a very suggestible personality go rogue for a while forget that he even had the experience where you were abusing your shamanistic privileges you were fucking taking someone in a vulnerable state of mind and brainwashing them but they were never able to have the person snap back into the assassin mode and kill them like that would be the perfect way they are saying what they were never able to prove manson was able to do and so the reason Tom was able to find so much about this was there are, ladies and gentlemen, 16,000 additional papers leaked about the uh, MK Ultra experiments. It goes over the Oklahoma City where he did his first ones, Jolly West, the Haight-Asbury. So there's uh, a 16,000-page article for U.S. Magazine if they actually want to get one of their own journalists on it rather than leeching off Tom out here. 
we're going a little long here. We'll sum up Jolly West's story. Definitely give this guy a Google. He's an American outlaw of many kinds. But in August 2nd of 1962, Oklahoma City Park Zoo. Dr. Jolly, he was not only able to experiment on college students, he was able to experiment on zoo animals. And the 7,000-pound elephant there, we needed to see what an elephant is going to do on LSD. He administered 2,800 micrograms to this beast, which is about, you know, 1,400 hits. The elephant immediately had a seizure and uh, defecated itself and died. So hundreds of millions of taxes a year are going to programs to uh, brainwash students. Thank you, Dr. Jolly West. <laughs> Tom is going, these last two chapters have been a bit of a data spew, but there are enough connections in here for another book, and it would have been crazy while he does have the limelight doing all these radio shows to not have put this in his book. And that brings us to our last chapter. Where does it all go? We started this entire rabbit hole trying to find a motive. That's what makes a narrative make sense. We learned from Stephen King, if there's no motive or character progression... There's nothing going on in the story, and Manson never had the motive. That's why the when he started to lose it behind bars, it made it look like, well, couldn't he have just done an insanity plea? I don't know. Maybe I should have been this fucking guy's defendant. <laughs> but for many summers, you know, Manson and Jolly West, Roger Smith, Agent Smith, Reeve Whitson, <laughs> Colonel Tate, all of these guys were walking the same streets, their paths crossed. And Tom is pretty much at wit's ends interviewing people. He went to a retired cop who participated in the Spawn Ranch raid. And the guy was like, we didn't honestly find anything that impressive. Like, it was basically a what you would expect a pseudo-psychedelic cult society to look like. It was terrible. Like, I'm saying Tarantino did a perfect job depicting the ranch. And then Brad Pitt shows up and punches the bitch boy in the face. Type of, it's perfect, man. And there's the old creepy guy who just orders the girls around from his fucking bunk. You wouldn't want to live there. Tom knows this. Tom got a call and an interview scheduled with Buglio. See, he's trying to put some of this to bed. And in 2006, he gets to go back to the Pasadena house. He gives a 45-minute rant up front about how, if you even mention my name in your book, I'm going to descend a team of lawyers, multiple teams on your estate, which he was not lying. After their interview, <laughs> there was an entire slur campaign about Tom's previous books. He was being doxxed, as you would say, on the internet. He got Russian trolled early on. This honestly gave Tom a little bit more traction and a bit of a name in the media, in the reading community. People were like, okay, if the prosecuting attorney is still involved with this guy, this book probably has some validity. So a little any press is good press there, Tom learned. Tom remembered his work em up skill, and you can get bugs to say just about anything. He is hunting wabbits. He goes... I have written in Helter Skelter, and I met with Terry Melcher, say, he never met with Manson more than three times. Why did you, Bugliosi, say that Terry never met with, had never been to the Spawn Ranch, when we know him and Manson were frolicking in the flowers tripping balls there together after the murder? Tom drops the mic, he's like, you committed perjury in trial, we need a retrial. And Bugliosi goes insidious. He's not even drunk at the time, but he's flaring out the mouth. Who do you think you are, a little investigative reporter? If you even touch my legacy, I've been in movies. I've written books bigger than yours will ever be. And Tom's motherfucking book is getting as big right now. There's a sweet ending to this. <laughs> we'll give you a Tom's uh, take on what actually happened. But that whole smear campaign went down. Tom was dropped by Penguin Publishing House, actually. And he had to get a finance by himself, have that published. This guy went around all of the blocks. It makes you wonder why they didn't want to publish his book. There's a lot of crazy evidence in here. Now, it's only circumstantial, but this is Tom's final take. There was a guy named Philip Tenerelli at the time in Southern California who went missing. And they found like his uh, beetle, his bug, off of the Pacific Coast Highway with a dead girl in it. And this is when the guy went off the radar. He was an unhinged mass murderer, and apparently the police say that he, <laughs> Mr. Tellorelli, 
shot himself in the mouth with a shotgun using his toe on the trigger. Imagine that was the picture of uh, Kurt Cobain. He used a toe. <laughs> I don't know why I think that's funny. It was because we're reading a murder book. Tenerelli also had his bail posted by a uh, probation officer that overlooked Manson. So this guy is probably involved in the web, but we are webbed out for now. A lot of Tom's open records FOIA requests had been rejected after 9-11. The government was getting very stingy with the information they let out. Yo, wasn't Trump campaigning on letting out more of the JFK files? We didn't even fucking touch on the Warren Commission today. That was all in the book. That was when the term conspiracy theorist was coined. If you didn't believe Earl Warren's magic bullet theory, guy, Supreme Court justice flew down to Texas and was like, President Kennedy, you know, you know there was more shrapnel in the guy under the bridge and the, the guy in the passenger seat. But the bullet was intact. It's a magic bullet. It killed him. It found, <laughs> it blew Kennedy's brain out. And if you question that, like the radio show hosts, we learned people were keen to it from the start. If you question that, you were put in the theorist community and ostracized. So always staying a step ahead. Tom is saying good luck to future reporters after 9-11. It's going to be real hard to get your hands on any sorts of declassified information. Fuck Trump for not putting that information out. That's bullshit. Tom thinks the night of the Tate murders, August 8, 1969, was a Hollywood elite drug run gone wrong, with Manson used as a metaphor for evil. In this investigative journey, Tom unearthed the underside of American politics and the countless hidden agendas at play. Thank you very much, Tom O'Neill. Thank you for your life, man. That is a huge contribution. I'm happy we got to do some justice on the show. Definitely suggest the read. Ladies and gentlemen, that takes us to September, and in September on the show, we go back to school. You might be doing school over Skype for all I know, Zoom University. I will be throwing the education around. We have Rizwan Verk's The Simulation Hypothesis. Some of the highest held scientists of our time, from Stephen Hawking, Michio Kaku, these guys believe we are in a simulation. The Bible refers to mortals. All those who take part in the games will refer to their sin and repent at the end. And then in the Tibetan game of Samsara, you got a fucking karma counter? Is that supposed to be my XP bar, bro? Think about it. As people, if our computers get strong enough, eventually we are going to run simulations to see how our reality would play out. And these super simulations would have sentient avatars within them. Has it happened already? We are going all into that in just two weeks here on the show. Customize that avatar, buy a new skin for the simulation hypothesis. We will be back real soon. Thank you guys for staying tuned. Love you. Peace.